Question number one. What types of myths weren't allowed to be tested due to interference by companies other than the RFID one? Well, I'm not going to talk. Oh, this is from forums. I knew the, the first question would be like this. Um, the fact is, is uh, we don't get a lot of interference from Discovery about, uh, about product testing because that's not what we do on the show. Um, we actually don't get a lot of interference from them about most of our story ideas because we're usually able to find ways to do them. We have been over 160 episodes, find ways to do them in ways that aren't offensive and don't actually go after anybody specific. Um, I do know that when we did the, when we beat the thumbprint detector, the USB, not the USB, but the, uh, the door lock thumbprint detector, that that company wanted to sue us for misrepresenting them even though we had actually, uh, read the copy they'd given us verbatim from their sales force. Um, besides that, really, you should understand that there are some subjects that we stay away from because they might go for a discovery client. They might go for a large advertiser discovery. I mean, the business model works that discovery makes us money from advertising, and we understand that business model, and, you know, we're not into biting the hand that feeds us. But it's precious few, really. It's, it's not like there's some big conspiracy out there despite what I said at the HOPE conference. All right, number two. How do you feel about people talking as go taking as gospel the results of myths busted or confirmed in less than scientific procedures? Or to rephrase, even though the shows are very entertaining and filled with cool factoids, there will still be a sizable number of people believing things are or are not possible on the basis of your conclusions. What do you think about that kind of power? Ready number four. That's a good question. Um, we will say repeatedly that we totally don't stand by our results. We stand by our methodologies. Um, we know that what we're doing from a, 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 an experimental rigor standpoint isn't very scientific. Uh, you can't call an experiment with only a data set of one or two or four experimentally rigorous. However, we really do try and tell a story about a rigor of methodology that each conclusion we're making is based on the previous conclusion. And hopefully, that's what people are taking away from the episodes. One of the things we do that I don't think anybody else has ever done on any kind of science show like this is we'll go back and say we screwed it up. We'll go back to an old episode and come to a completely different conclusion based on new data, new experiment, new information that we had. Uh, and we've done it dozens and dozens of times. So I hope that any regular watcher would see that we're willing to have our mind changed about our own conclusions once we get better data in. So again, that's the, what we consider to be the teaching of the show. That's the, that's the story we're trying to tell. Um, if people are still going to believe it, well, I'm not going to be able to convince them anyway. You know, I mean, no, no, no episode that we could do about the World Trade Center towers unless we used full-size World Trade Center towers would convince people who think that it's somehow an inside job. I can't help those people. <laughs> Number three, how many drinking myth experiments can you possibly do before Discovery starts getting suspicious? <laughs> Mad Frogert. Frogert, I haven't heard that word in ages. Uh, drinking myths. I don't think we're going to do any more drinking myths. I have to tell you, Jamie and I conferred about it this year. Uh, the last time we did that drinking episode, we had to get drunk three times in one week during work, which I know to some people sounds great, but it's functionally horrible. Uh, you, you're hung over by like 8 p.m. Uh, it's really difficult to have a good time when you've also got to be on camera. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a fine episode. I'm really pleased about it. But I don't feel like drinking on the job to get drunk ever again. So I think that's pretty much it for the alcohol beds. Have you ever filmed a myth busting but not aired it after determining the facts discovered would end up in viewers getting hurt? Or more generally, have you ever been concerned about the effects of releasing information you discovered? GB Steve. Um, we have never not aired something because we've been afraid that someone would try it. Um, we are genuinely afraid that people will try stuff, which is why we try and show, you know, that we're always standing behind bulletproof glass when we do experiments. Um, we're wearing all the protective clothing we should be wearing, except maybe sometimes for eye protection. But that's just bravado on Jamie's and my part. Um, we really go to great lengths when we do the full-size experiments to consider what all the possible worst-case scenarios are and to accommodate them and show those accommodations we make on camera. Um, 
to date, I think there's been three or four cases of people getting hurt, saying they saw, they, they tried something they saw on Mythbusters, and in every case, the thing they were doing was never something we did on Mythbusters. I don't know if they confused it with Brainiac or something else, but we have yet to be responsible for some kind of accident like that. Um, more generally, have you ever been concerned about the effects of releasing information you discovered? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to do an episode on silencers, like do movie type silencers, uh, really, are they really as quiet? I've gone to silencer demos, we've done a lot of research down this line, but there's a point at which what's interesting about silencers, which is that they're not as quiet as you think, and then in some cases they're actually pretty darn quiet. Uh, of course, if you're going to do an episode on that, you've got to do one on home-built silencers, pillows and soda bottles and I guess all these other techniques that people have out there. And as soon as you do that, you're drifting into this territory of teaching people how to silence guns, which is not the business we're in. So there's definitely subjects we consider, we don't really want to traipse down that path because we don't want to do a how-to. Um, in that case, we don't ever get that story to air. We talk about ways to do it until we figure out a way to do it, and if we don't, we don't end up shooting it. Number five, what upcoming technology excites you the most? Wow. Um, that's a good question. It's from Pathogen. What upcoming technology excites me the most? Um, Pico projectors. <laughs> I'm still, I still want to get one that's bright enough so that I can put it in my R2-D2 and actually project Princess Leia out in front of my R2-D2. I won't consider my R2 finished until I can have that projection. Um, actually, I also just got the, uh, the, the, the Canon 5D Mark II, and I've been playing around with the HD video on it, and it's like so much fracking fun. I do a lot of little uh, filmmaking on the side of my own stuff that I've been playing with, and uh, I, I play with that thing every couple of days. It's awesome. Make my cameraman on the crew jealous. Uh, number six, what was the most surprising outcome to a myth you ever busted? K-O-P, or COP. Um, the, the thing about, the, this is a really common question, do we get surprised by stories? Um, all the time, uh, constantly, in fact, probably 30% of the time, we start with a shooting outline. We start with a general idea of how what we're going to do is going to work. And, you know, it's like scale experiments, maybe a mid-size experiment, maybe a trip to the, to the junkyard, and then the full-size experiment. And, you know, at the beginning of the story, we have a pretty good idea of what we're going to put into it. But um, probably about 30 or 40 percent of the time, we finish a scale experiment down here in the shop and come to a totally different result than we expected and realize that we have to change everything from there on. Um, and that happens a reasonable period of the time to feel like it's actually science that's going on. Um, that we're, you know, totally flummoxed by something and realize, oh, we have to go in a totally different direction. 